the way. Um, anyway, uh, so today, uh, today our uh, speaker is uh, Brock Peterson. Uh, uh, he uh, is an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from Brigham Young. Uh, he um, he was working at uh, Georgia Tech on his PhD, uh, but uh, moved here recently uh, with with uh, Mark Allen in 2014, where he's uh, been working on um, some of of what became uh, electromagnetic. So, uh, without further ado, Brock. Thank you. So I don't know if I quite call it electromagnetics, but it's close enough. Let me turn it to the other screen. Okay. So today I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about some of my laser micro-machined magnets um, and the fields that they can generate. Um, as he said, I am one of Dr. Allen's graduate students, the, hopefully the first PhD to graduate from him. Uh, so why are magnets so important? And we can see some of their larger scale uses here on the screen. Um, so what if you could take an MRI and put it on the tip of a microscope or an endoscope or, you know, well, create an x-ray machine that's portable? Um, there are quite a few other applications. You can think about shrinking some of these down um, where magnets become very useful. Um, now, one of the problems is magnets are not always easy to use. So, just a little overview of what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to start by talking about magnets in general in case anyone's not quite as familiar as um, well, myself. <laughs> um, and talk about the, the shrinking down of these, these magnets and some of the magnets that do already exist in MEMS um, and some of their downfalls and where my magnets can, uh, can make up for the difference. So magnets can be generated by um, rocks, they're magnetite or lodestone in some forms, um, or DC currents traveling through uh, any conductor. I'm mostly going to be talking about permanent magnets and not electromagnets, although I will be talking about the comparison between them. Um, here you can see how magnets are generally formed or how the magnetic field is generated from a permanent magnet. Now with no field, the moments within um, each little domain inside of the magnetic material um, is randomly oriented. And so you get essentially nothing from the overall magnet. But when you apply a field and align all of those domains inside the magnet, it becomes magnetized and you have a leftover, a remnant magnetization. Um, and one of the key points that, we, that I focus on um, with my magnets is that magnetic fields superpose upon one another. So just like with this compass needle, two magnets can deflect differently than a single magnet. Um, and it is linear the addition between them. And I'm not sure how many of you were at the lecture that was here in the Sing Center last week about um, moving magnets with other permanent magnets and the rotation of those magnets. Uh, but it essentially uses that, the exact same principle, um, just over much larger distances. Um, so a couple of things that are really important for magnets are that they are very high energy density um, and that you don't have to touch anything to use them. Um, in fact, that's also one of their downfalls and why a lot of people don't like to use them. Um, and for us electrical engineers, they can do very bad things to CRTs and uh, scopes. So magnets, permanent magnets in particular, scale very well. You can see this quality chart here. Um, basically, they, they scale really well as, as the dimensions of the magnet go down, um, especially as compared to currents in electrical conductors because that copper, whatever, whatever other metal it is, can only handle so much current. Um, so as you shrink these magnets down, their interactions with other magnetic materials um, actually improves. Um, now this is why people are so interested in putting magnets in MEMS, um, but there is another problem when you're building a magnet up from the bottom. Um, basically as you increase the thickness of the film, the properties, the magnetic properties of the material go down. And you can see here, um, just some like grain sizes that are on the same sample after growing it further. So like I said, with the domains, how they're aligned, you get some randomization if the grains become too large. Um, 
So here's a little chart showing where my magnets tend to fit in. Um, so you can see that we have you know, sputtering, electroplating. These tend to be obviously the smallest. We have bonded neodymium, which is really just kind of embedded in a, a resin of some kind. Um, then we have larger magnets being sintered metals, NDFEB or samarium cobalt, which is the material that I use. And my laser machine materials fit somewhere in this range. Now, they do share the same space with that bonded NDFEB, but the, the bonded, in this case, have a couple of downfalls. First of all, the magnetic properties are nowhere near as good as the samarium cobalt as, as a sintered metal like this here. Um, secondly, they're usually only magnetized in a single direction. And when they're not, they're magnetized first in a single direction and then reverse magnetized the opposite direction. So you lose some field in either case. Uh, just to show you some of those um, properties, the magnetic properties, we have remnants, which is essentially where the line here cur crosses the y-axis. Um, and that's essentially, we'll say, how bent this cantilever is. Um, and then as you reverse magnetize, you reach what's called coercivity at the x-axis. Um, that's just how much, how much the magnet material is resisting that applied magnetic field. It's essentially applying a force to level out this, um, this cantilever. Um, and so the bigger the square or rectangle we have underneath this curve, the larger um, BH is. This is the energy product such that a large energy product magnet can be used in a, with less material than a material that has a lower energy product for the same purpose. Um, and there are thermal considerations with magnets, which is, again, somewhat of a problem with MEMS, um, particularly the problem with me and lasers. Um, here's some examples of magnets being electroplated, bonded, and uh, ceramic cobalt that I use. Um, now magnets have what's called a Curie temperature. And this is where the magnet loses all of its magnetization. Now, after you remove that heat, you can remagnetize it so it can be used again. But say you had it magnetized in two, two different directions side by side, you then lose that, um, that magnetic structure. Um, now, if you happen to reach temperatures closer to melting or those kind of temperatures, this is no longer true. You've now removed all magnetic domains that you have inside the material or the boundaries between those domains. So a little background on laser machining so you know where I'm coming from. Um, I did actually help bring the lasers here to sing, the SYNC Center that are there. So if you do have any questions about that, they come to me. Um, but basically, traditional laser machining um, for metals that you would think of, as you machine the metal, it takes that melt that's on the surface and drags it through the material. Um, this isn't obviously a good thing for heat because that's pure heat. Uh, so this is a very traditional laser machining, but it gives you a good idea of what actually happens, such that you generate cracks in the material, there's a heat-affected zone, there's ejected molten material. Um, there's a number of problems with this. And I'll talk about how that can be mitigated in, a, in just a minute. Um, just some examples of laser machining, just a simple CO2 that I know is in a couple of labs here on campus. Um, here's a fiber laser cutting metal. It's a slightly messier process. Um, now these are our lasers here at Penn, where I can still generate sparks, so no need to worry. Um, but this is an aluminum sheet that I did machine with that IR laser as well. Um, and here's some more examples of laser machining. Here's the system actually in the SYNC Center. Um, but we can create a lot of MEMS dimension devices. Um, it's really just limited to your imagination. So if you do have questions or, or things that you'd like to discuss, go ahead and bring them to me or Eric Johnston over in the SYNC Center. So going back to how these lasers affect my magnets, uh, I was talking about the Curie temperature earlier. So lasers generally create thousands of degrees on part. Um, now, how far into the material that affected zone goes is based on the conductivity and how long the laser pulse is on and things like that. 
Um, but we can reduce that heat affected zone by changing the energy put in, the power being used, so how frequently those shots are hitting the part. Um, the wavelength also matters a great deal, such like CO2 lasers are at 10 microns, and as you shrink that down to one micron, 532 nanometers, or below 200 nanometers, um, the wavelength anyways, the heat that you're dissipating is generally less because you're interacting more with the material on a chemical level in most cases. Then the pulse length is also important because um, the light doesn't have enough time to interact with the electrons, the phonons really, in the material and create vibrations as you shorten that pulse length. So if you ever hear someone talking about a picosecond laser, that's what that's for, is to have basically no heat in the material and still get enough ablation to um, really get what you want. So moving on to magnets. So these are some examples of some micromachine magnets in the SEM. Uh, you can see we can get down to sub 100 micron sizes. And these are all 300 microns thick. Um, and the study that we were doing here was to see how, mu how deep inside the material the laser is actually affecting these magnets. And so they're all the same height, they're all the same length. What was changed was the width so we could see as you shrink it down further and further, does it, is there a point where I no longer have magnetization but I still have material? Um, so this is the very simple fabrication process. I start with this 10 by 5 millimeter substrate, machine it down, um, do a little cleaning using citric acid to remove all the that remelt, that junk that's on the sides. Um, and then measure them and magnetize them and get them I, so I measured the physical dimensions here and then measured the magnetic properties after magnetization. Uh, now the idea here with this is we couldn't really see um, like a gradient of change within the material, like how the, uh, that laser image was showing how there's like a red section, orange section, yellow section. We couldn't really see that, so we just assumed that all the material close to the surface was damaged and just had no magnetic material left, um, and created a model, a simple model from that. Now, as you can see on the right side, um, these are points, the diamonds, the blue diamonds are um, neodymium iron boron, which is essentially a better material in bulk than samarium cobalt, um, but it's also more heat sensitive and oxidizes. Um, the purple X's are samarium cobalt. And so as you can see, there is a point where ne neodymium is better, but that's bigger than like 300 microns in width. And we're talking mem scale, so we want to get a lot smaller than that. Um, but the samarium cobalt can go significantly lower and still maintain a lot more of that magnetization. Uh, so moving to a slightly more complicated setup, we have... Now instead of just a single bar, so a single magnet like you would have on your fridge or something like that, we now have um, alternating pole magnetic fields. Uh, so this is important for structures like in a motor or a generator. You have the magnets are always oppositely poled um, so that as you apply a current on the rotor of the, of the, uh, of the motor, it will move and it uses the permanent magnets to do that. You can use currents, but for this example, they use north and south. Um, and so with this project, we needed to have a magnetic field periodicity between 200 and 500 microns. Um, and I actually have an example here, if you'd like to see it, of a 400 micron setup. Um, and then have at least, I think it was 0.15 Tesla, um, above the surface of the magnet and enough periods that you um, can well generate x-rays as the electron travels in that field. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but we also needed to model how much the laser, the lost laser material was going to be affecting this north-south structure. What we discovered is that with this 40% lost material between poles, we only lose about 20% of the overall sinusoidal amplitude, um, which was really good for us. Um, the other problem that we had was um, this way, and it's not going the right direction. 
So in the case that we say we have 40% material lost, now if you put those magnets side by side, they would literally just smack up against each other again um, if they had nothing to maintain that periodicity. Um, and so with this, we had to design a, an assembly method so that we can get a nice uniform period all the way across the undulator. Now part of the problem I had was my substrate's only 10 millimeters long, so I have to make something that can go further. And if we offset these um, combs, if you will, by half the length of the comb, I can then continue to add further onto that array as long as I don't break them. Um, so this is just the uh, fabrication process again. Here you can see the a finalized array of 20 millimeters. Um, there's 50 periods of magnetic field in there, and it is um, a single array is about 0.1 to 0.13 tesla uh, peak. And you can see, not sure how well you can see that back there, but there are lines showing um, the difference in magnetic field between north and south poles. Besides. <laughs> So then comparison to um, the model that we had to try and see if, um, if it was behaving as it should, um, it came out that we had really good agreement between what COMSOL was showing at a certain distance above the magnet, different distances, and um, what the magnetic field was actually measured at for those same heights. Um, So a little background on our testing. Um, so the original project that I was talking about was to generate x-rays in the field of battle, say. Um, it is a DARPA program, such that um, you know, they could use it in a very small device, portable at least. Um, tabletop was, ex was even OK. Um, but this undulator, this piece here that's normally multiple meters long, um, in our case, you saw the last image, it was 20 millimeters, okay, so it's uh, significantly smaller. Um, well, the way this works is this is in a vacuum, okay, so there's no air. They take free traveling electrons and they pass them through the length of this undulator. And just like if you were to take a wire and put it in a magnetic field, those electrons passing through the wire or in free space feel that undulating field, um, hence the term undulator. Um, now when you think about an oscillating electron, those are any ion or charge really, um, it will always generate electromagnetic radiation in a donut shape around that, around that charge, assuming it's oscillating in this, the direction of the arrow. Um, now if you incorporate relativistic physics, and accelerate this to very close to the speed of light. Um, so if, if you know, the SEMs here can, I think, operate between 10 kilo electron volts and some maybe up to 200 kilo electron volts. Um, most of these um, facilities that use these undulators, the fields are, the electrons are traveling at about 1 to 20 giga electron volts. Uh, so a few orders of magnitude higher. Um, and as you do that, the Emitted electromagnetic radiation in the direction of travel is uh, basically frequency shifted, almost like you'd have with a, an ambulance traveling down the street. It sounds different coming towards you than it does traveling away. Um, so this is the exact same concept. So there is still radiation in the back direction, but because it's so low in frequency, because of that frequency shift, um, everything is pretty much coming out that front end. And this is how they generate the, the x-rays from a traveling electron. Um, to give you an idea of our goal, uh, we were intending to be in this purple box um, where the state of the art is down here in the corner. And basically, as you go further in this direction, the required input energy is much lower for a given output electromagnetic um, energy. Um, and so essentially the, the smaller the accelerator can be. Um, these are just some of the, the governing equations that um, are used in this field. 
Um, now, because of the size of our undulator, this lambda u makes it so that um, we have a very small k, which makes the equation come out much simpler. Um, that's not to say, for some of the other factors, it you know, still remains a challenge to, to be used in the field. Um, but I'll talk about that in the results as well. Now, I was talking about the undulator that you saw from Stanford, where there were two magnet arrays, one on top of the other. Um, and I showed previously the single magnet array, just so you could see um, all the periods within it, um, this one down here. But in order to get higher field, we needed to take two arrays of these microarrays and place them on top of each other as well, um, using that same concept of superposition. Um, just to show you some of the collaboratives that we had, we worked with UCLA on measuring the device, um, and all three of them on actually testing the device in um, particle accelerators. Um, so something interesting about the, the testing of, this, um, of these devices. So you can see here, I'll show you a zoomed in picture in just a minute, but essentially this is about 200 microns tall by two millimeters wide, and the length of the, the total undulator is again 20 millimeters. Um, they're firing these electrons traveling close to the speed of light from about two miles away. Okay, so they have to be extremely precise. Um, and even then, they're used to hitting a target that's, you know, half a meter open, um, not 200 microns tall. And so, with that and the end of the funding of the program, um, we were only te able to test a few times, but essentially we were able to see that we do generate some form of um, undulator-based light, um, and not just um, what they call Bremsstrahlung radiation, where the electron is traveling through a metal and can actually generate those same kind of x-rays. In this case, this is actually, I think it was green light. It was close to five, 550 nanometers. And so the x-rays would not be generated, and it would just be undulator light that's really being generated. Um, and so we thought that promising. And here's the zoomed in picture, these undulators here. And so we had a few so that we could test different setups. Um, so these are some of the, the publications that we've had. Uh, we intend to take this a little bit further and move uh, towards slightly more complicated magnetic field patterns um, using these lasers and assembly technology. Um, now if you have any questions, I'll be glad to take them. If you do have any questions about lasers, don't hesitate. <laughs>